Hi, I'm Phil Hill, and welcome to eLiterate TV's series on personalized learning. In the last two episodes, we've been looking at UC Davis and how a team has redesigned the Intro to Chemistry and the Intro to Biology courses in order to improve the number of students who successfully get a STEM-based degree. What are the benefits that they're seeing so far with this new approach? And what are the primary barriers that they face as they try to get more faculty members to adopt this type of redesign? As we'll see, faculty and staff leading these changes are swimming upstream, moving against the current of established faculty reward system and student expectations. Catherine, what about within chemistry? What's your observation of their academic performance? My, I, I can only speak anecdotally right now because we're still in the process of analyzing some of the data. But just compared to like my students from like one year ago when I was doing a traditional like lecture approach and I was like that first time teaching the class and I was not really feeling that my students were understanding things to my students last quarter, there was like night and day difference between the two sets of students and the, the caliber of questions that they asked in class because like they actually had some background knowledge and so the questions that they came with were on a completely different level mm -hmm. and they did a much much better on midterms and exams and even we have a common final exam mm -hmm. between all sections and they did really well on that too. Several students that we talked to described similar benefits from their experiences in the Introduction to Biology class. So other thoughts, what, what works well in this type of class? How, how would you describe it? Um, well, being interactive, I feel like, yeah, it is a lot more work than just passively sitting there and taking notes, but when I do the drawings or when somebody answers the question or if I'm discussing something with someone, I feel like I absorb the information better and it just sticks and that really helps for the midterms. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for me, what's really nice about it is it almost forces you to pay attention. You know, a lot of my other classes, you know, there'll be a PowerPoint and you'll, you'll be taking notes, you'll just be writing word for word what's on the PowerPoint and you won't really be, you know, digesting the actual information that the professor is saying as well as, you know, what's going on in the PowerPoint. And in this, in this bio class, it's not so much about, you know, he, set, he sends out the, the PowerPoints to you, so you don't really have to, you know, copy word for word what's on the PowerPoints. It's more about understanding what's going on and, you know, with all the drawings, you know, understanding how to draw, what's going on you know, uh, with its structures and functions of different things in, in the world of biology. And it really helps you, you know, rather than just memorizing facts, to actually understand the concepts that are, that are going on. Okay. Well, I see some head nodding. Is it the same situation for the two of you? Yeah, I actually, um, even in my discussion course, I don't have uh, as involved of a TA as Edward does, I guess. But sometimes she'll be like talking and I'll be doing a workbook and then she asks me a question, I have no idea what's going on. And um, you don't, definitely don't get that feeling during lecture. Because mm -hmm. you do have to pay attention. <laughs> sure, Amy? Yeah, I would definitely agree. I mean, it's just really, you do have to really pay attention. Like in some of my other classes where I'm just taking notes, I will write word for word and I'll look back and I'll have to read what I wrote and study it again. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. But for this, it's like, I don't, it doesn't really feel like it's note taking. It just feels like you're just learning and kind of copying down the drawings. So I feel like it's a lot more helpful. While the new approach works for many students, some struggle and prefer the traditional lecture format. So I actually kind of have more of a criticism sure. when it comes to this. So I, I just like to say, I think it's supposed to work like that with, with thinking more critically, but it ends up turning out to be kind of more vague. And it's more you, I've had a lot of difficulty trying to figure out what to study. I know we have the pre and post study guides and they are supposed to be helpful and they are kind of helpful. But I've also noticed that the way we're supposed to study does not help me very much. So we're supposed to like draw a picture and and label things, try to figure it out. And if, if we get it wrong or we start thinking critically the wrong way or whatever, I feel like it's not drilling in the concept as well as it could be. While the team at UC Davis is seeing some encouraging initial results from their course redesign, these changes are not easy. In our discussions, the faculty and staff provided insight into the primary barriers that they face when looking to build on their success and get other faculty members to redesign their courses. Um, well, I have 
had some very interesting experiences with students. Um, last quarter, my class was mostly incoming freshmen, and it's like their very first quarter at UC Davis, and so they have never taken a UC Davis class before. And so my class is pretty different from either classes they've taken in high school or other classes that they were still taking in their first quarter at Davis because like these changes are not as widespread as they could be. Mm -hmm. And so some students like pushed back at first and they're like, oh my gosh, like I have to read the book. Oh my gosh, like I have to open the textbook. Oh my gosh, I have to do homework every week. I have to do homework every day. Like they're, they're, they kind of freaked out a little bit in the beginning. But as the quarter progressed, they realized that they are capable of doing this type of learning style. And I got some amazing students that came back to me at the end of the quarter. They were like, oh my gosh, I loved your class because it really taught me that I am in control of my own learning and I can do this and I can learn this way. And that's incredible. Your class was outright boisterous. I mean, it was, they <laughs> yeah. didn't stop talking. Yeah, it was hard to get them to quiet down. They were so in love with talking to each other. But the biggest barrier might be with faculty members. Too often the discussion is about resistance to new ideas without addressing the existing structural barriers. It sounds like there's some very exciting changes, you know, boisterous students, people wanting to learn is some of what I'm hearing. Um, what's the biggest barrier that you guys face in terms of getting more of this cultural change to go throughout UC Davis? What do you see as the biggest barrier moving forward? Should I take this one? Well, yeah. I, think, I think we all have some in mind. So yeah, I'll, I'll ask each one of you. So, Aaron, yeah. um, go for it. Go for it. Incentivizing good teaching at the university. As it currently stands, most incentives that are built into the tenure package are based on research quality, not on teaching quality. And so asking instructors to put a lot of time and effort and energy into making these big instructional changes, it's hard to incentivize that. when. If they're going up for tenure, they they want to spend more time. It's in the lab. risky. Yeah, yeah. So it's the faculty um, compensation or reward system is not in alignment with spending time on improving teaching. Is that is that an accurate statement? Yes. Yep. That's one key structural barrier. Yeah. So Chris, what would you say? Even if it's the same thing, what do you see as the biggest barrier to this cultural shift? So the next step would be, um, let's imagine it was incentivized. It takes a lot of work to transform your instruction, it, and it takes it's a, a bit of, also a bit of an emotional roller coaster when you change out of a habitual behavior. You know they call it the J curve. You, you immediately your performance goes down, your attitude and affect goes down, and it takes somebody there to help you through both that process and to. We need expertise, so there's a major resource deficit that we have now that. Even if we were ready, if everyone was intellectually and emotionally ready to transform their instruction, um, it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of resources to get there. And so that's another thing that we would need to ramp up. Sure. And Catherine, especially with even more of a first-hand view, what do you see as the biggest barrier? Well, like, in a way I was fortunate because I was more of a newbie instructor and so like I I didn't have like 20 years of experience where I had done it this other way. And just coming in and telling instructors, hey, that thing that you've been doing for 20 years, you could be doing it better. Like they don't want to hear that. And so like they have worked very hard over the past like 15, 20 plus years to optimize their instructional methods to the best of their ability within like their set of norm Practices. And the feedback that they were getting. And the feedback. So there's a huge emphasis on like student evaluations and how much students like you, mm -hmm. which is not really correlated at all with how much they're actually learning. And so like, you know, if that's the only measure of student learning or student anything in the class is student evaluations, then like that's what the instructor is tuning for. They're not really figuring out if their students are learning or turning their mirror on themselves and saying like, what can I do to improve my students' learning? They're just saying, what can I do to make my students like me better? Well, actually, so I'd like you to go a little bit more detail on course evaluations as they're currently used. Mm -hmm. And I think I heard you say it's, those are more based on, 
do students like me? So what, what do the current course evaluations really measure? Like what direction Nothing. does it push faculty? <laughs> um, in my opinion, the student evaluations are pretty much worthless because the questions that they ask are very generic. It's like, does the person speak loud? Mm -hmm. Are their visual aids clear? It's, it's very generic and bland. And then it gets down to the only question that they really care about is, oh, rate the overall performance of this instructor. And what we have found in like my flipped class and any of these like kind of where the lecturer is like changing their style mm -hmm. and making the emphasis more on the students, the students are thinking, well, I learned all this material on my own. So the instructor didn't teach me that material Therefore, I'm going to rate the instructor lower because they were not as valuable to me. Mm -hmm. right. When you make the students do more work, they don't like you as much. <laughs> and that hurts your course evaluations, which in turn feeds back into the incentivization issue. Yeah. It's a challenge if you're not uh, thinking about education all day. Uh, and most of us have you know, research labs that occupy a lot of time as well. Uh, administrative duties and all that type of thing. So, so if edu you, know, you're, you don't have training there, there's a lot of catching up to do. And uh, most institutions have great resources on campus for, uh, you know, there's people dying here at Iams Den to, to help and uh, to, to catalyze some of these things. So seek help. Uh, be realistic about how much you're going to change the first time around and have kind of a long-term mm -hmm. uh, plan for what you'd like to achieve. I think the biggest barrier we have right now is that the uh, faculty reward system doesn't yet take into account this type of experimentation and doesn't really promote a faculty member based on the quality of their instruction and the effects that they've had on student learning. And we're working together with now a small group of faculty to try to come up with alternative metrics aside from the traditional classroom evaluation numbers which have been so central to the tenure and promotion process. We're trying to actually expand that so we have a more comprehensive view of what's happening in an individual class. UC Davis has chosen to address the challenging task of personalizing the most impersonal of learning experiences, the large lecture classes. The vast majority of students who leave STEM degrees early do so in the first two years, where their primary experience is with large lecture classes. The early results with intro to chemistry and intro to biology are encouraging, with improved retention and evidence of improved understanding. However, the changes are difficult, and the biggest barriers to spreading this approach include the faculty reward system and student expectations over what learning should be.